Okay, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation and this workshop. I really enjoyed the talks. They're very, very good quality, I think. Uh, I'm going to talk about learning combinatorial structures. I did my PhD at MIT and this was joint work with my advisors, Michelle and Patrick. And uh, currently I'm at the Simons Institute. I'm going to join Georgia Tech uh, in, uh, in the summer this, uh, this year. So I'm going to start with uh, a few, uh, I'm going to talk about a few fundamental questions in combinatorial optimization motivated by bottlenecks that people observe, uh, people have in online learning and machine learning and so on. And the first question is how to compute projections. So I'm, I'm just going to write the, the questions here so that it's easier to keep track of the talk. And uh, so projections, are, just think of projections as computing the point in my body that makes the most sense. So if I had a ball and I dropped it on the floor, where would it hit? If, uh, uh, if I dropped it on a cube, what's the cube that makes the most sense? I could, I'm going to talk about oh, sorry. this year. And uh, this is joint work with my PhD thesis advisors, Michelle Gomez and Patrick Jaye. I'm going to talk about learning combinatorial structures. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to try to talk about two questions, maybe three, if there is time. The first is projections. So how do you compute projections? And one can think about projections as computing the uh, point in my body, in my convex body, which makes the most sense, which is the shortest distance point. And uh, if I were to drop a ball on, on a rectangle, then where would it hit? Or where would the rectangle attract that ball? Uh, in general, I'm going to be talking about polytopes, which are described with an exponential number of hyperplanes. So the problem becomes more complex because you can't even write down all of these hyperplanes uh, in polynomial time. And uh, when we think about distances, we think about straight line distances. But more generally here, we're going to be considering minimizing what are known as Bregman divergences. So they are not straight line distances, but they might come from, uh, the closest point might come from minimizing a convex function over my combinatorial set on my polytope. Right. So first, let's answer the question about why are these projections important? Why do I care about this question? And the simple answer to that is it's a key step in many algorithms across online learning, game theory, machine learning, robust and stochastic optimization. So in the next few slides, I'm going to just focus on online learning and give you a very simple example, a toy example of how these projections arise as a bottleneck in many online learning algorithms. So when I go to Amazon and I uh, try to buy a book, we all try to buy books. Uh, this was a very nice book on black box society and how algorithms are controlling all the information about us. Amazon immediately threw many recommendations at me. So it uh, told me about this weapons of math destruction, which is slightly uh, a lesser mathematical text. But it's not very good at doing this because it's showing that twice. But the point is that engaging customers by showing them personalized recommendations is key in increasing the shop, uh, shopping cart size or the profit margins of many retailers. And the basic question they want to answer is that can we learn the best ordering of items to show our customers so that the items that are most relevant to them should appear at the top of my list? So can, can we do that, uh, display to a new customer by learning from similar past customers? And this brings us to the problem of online learning, which typically starts with there's some historical data or some prior knowledge that we have. We make an action or select a decision, so, so, uh, show some items to our customers, and then we observe some uh, losses or profits. So they not, may not be in the typical business sense, but we observe some uh, ramifications of our decisions, and we go back and update our action. And this process continues over time. So uh, in online learning, the goal is really to perform well compared to certain best fixed decision in hindsight. So at some point in the future, if I knew exactly how my users were reacting, what their preferences were, then how well did I do compared to learning the best preference at the last, at some point in the future? That's typically the metric. And in the example here of uh, showing recommendations to customers, I might, uh, I could think about items as just an ordered list. Right? So I just, I'm placing items in some ordered manner. Once I do that, uh, 
I display that to the customers and I observe the click-through rates. So my customers, uh, it's a pool of users, they're going to, by, with some probability, they're going to click on some item or the other. And ideally I would want the item with the highest click-through rate, that's item one, that should be displayed at the top of the list, right? So that's my learning process. I would slowly like to move to a, a recommendation or a, an ordering that makes more sense. And one way to do this is to define some losses such that minimizing them can help us learn, help us go towards the objective that, uh, with which we created this learning problem. And here we can just think about the click-through vector and try to minimize the loss, which is a linear function of the click-through vector and the permutations. So what happens uh, in this talk, we are going to look at combinatorial objects. And if you have linear losses, then this becomes a nice problem where you want to learn over the convex hull of uh, these combinatorial objects and not just on the pure permutations. You can start thinking about convex, uh, you can think about convex combinations or permutations or a probability distribution over rankings. And uh, okay, so this is the online learning framework where the learner chooses a decision in a polytope P. This is typically the decision space is a convex hull of permutations now. Instead of just looking at uh, pure permutations, I can randomize my decisions. There's a linear loss that's revealed and uh, some losses incurred for time t. The metric of performance is what is known as regret. So this is what if I summed up the losses that I saw for over all periods of time from 1 to t, and uh, that's the loss I incurred as, as the learning algorithm, and what was the best that I could do if I had all of the information in hindsight. So that's the second term. And the state-of-the-art techniques in literature, they try to balance the time required for computing this and the regret guarantees, which is the performance. Right. So uh, regret is how well I could learn the customer preferences. The time tells me how fast I could make these decisions. And um, one very nice class of algorithms uh, is the online mirror descent, mirror descent, stochastic mirror descent, and so on. These are projection-based first-order methods that only require the knowledge of that loss vector that you had observed in each time step and they update the decisions, but they are not, even though they obtain uh, near optimal regret guarantees in many cases, they are not computationally very fast. So let's see about what the computational bottleneck here is. In online mirror descent, the algorithm starts with a point inside my decision set. So let's say it's x1, then it observes some, it displays some permutation or ranking dependent on that x1. It observes the environment and users, so their click-through rates, and that's the loss vector L1. Then it incurs that loss and updates. This update of the strategy is typically an unconstrained gradient step that might lead my vector to go outside of my feasible set of solutions, or feasible decisions, right? And so now this brings us to the projection problem, what, which, might occur, which might happen in each iteration of this online mirror descent sort of an algorithm. And these are obtained by minimizing convex functions, and this is the major bottleneck of this algorithm. The learning process continues by, uh, continues by considering the projected point, and uh, that's how the learning algorithm process uh, proceeds. I want to produce a probability distribution on rankings, or I could think about spanning trees, or I could think about any combinatorial object, right? I, um, I'm, I'm going to come to the setting, the exact setting, but online mirror descent is going to work in whenever you have a separation oracle, yes, right? Because you could do convex optimization using the ellipsoid method. But the question is going to be, can we do it faster while obtaining your optimal regret guarantees? So for some model of polytopes that I'm going to talk about, the separation oracle is some model of function minimization, so it's, So that, that's going to be very expensive. Yeah. Okay, so um, projections are important because they appear as a key step in many algorithms, like online mirror descent, saddle point mirror descent, uh, mirror procs, optimistic mirror descent. So these are various, uh, like, you know, for solving games, for doing some robust optimization, to do some stochastic optimization and so on, whenever there is a constrained decision set. So all of these problems, all of these algorithms will run into this projection problem when you have a constrained decision set. And um, 
This is just to show the applications in the industry. So for Amazon, you might think about rec product recommendations, you might think about scheduling jobs online. And when you schedule jobs online, the loss is the amount of time the job takes. And you want to minimize the total uh, make span of the jobs or the total amount of time people have to wait. Macy's similar questions arise when you're pricing items. In Google Maps, when you're learning paths and the loss comes to you as congestion that you observe on the paths, you want to minimize that. In Intel, on the chips, there is a node that has to communicate across components and synchronize information after every some steps. So you want to select a spanning tree and broadcast messages on that. And they have their own reasons to do that, and so on. So uh, OK. So I think I've motivated the problem enough. So let's go to the technical results. Uh, I need to define two things still. What are the decision sets? And what are the convex functions I'm minimizing to compute the projections? So the answer to the first question are what are known as submodular based polytopes. How many people have heard of submodular based polytopes before? OK. So very few. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I cannot cover a lot of the background on submodularity, so we'll keep it very short and precise. Uh, you, we had these permutations, right, in the examples. Perm the permutahedron is an example of the submodular based polytope. It's a convex hull of all the permutations. That's the white shaded region. And uh, some modular polytopes are uh, these, uh, the, the bigger polytope, which is PF, which is defined with respect to uh, a ground set, which is E. So the ground set here is the numbers that I'm ordering. And the submodular set function gives assigns a value to every subset of these numbers. And it tells me that I cannot, I cannot put, uh, I cannot raise any subset to a value greater than the submodular function value. Those are the constraints. And as you can see, the number of subsets is exponential in the size of the ground set. So these are an exponential number of constraints. The base polytope tells me what's the farthest I can go while maintaining these constraints. So it's sort of like the maximal permutation that I can get. And that's, uh, that's what we are interested in. So that's a face of the submodular polytope. These submodular functions have been used uh, to model uh, uh, combinatorial structure, they capture the property of diminishing returns, so they're very nice uh, set functions to work with. And just plugging in different submodular functions gives you different structures. So if I just plug in that very simple uh, uh, convex, uh, concave function there as f of s, that gives me the permutahedron. If I were plugging in f of s equal to uh, the number of components in, in a, a set of edges, then it would give me spanning trees as the submodular polytope and so on. So the choice of the submodular function gives you many interesting combinatorial objects. But for the purpose of this talk, we can just concentrate on uh, the base polytope, which is the uh, convex hull of permutations. So now coming to the second question, what are these Bregman divergences and why do we care? These Bregman divergences are, um, they're not symmetric. So they're not distance functions. And um, they're defined with respect to a convex function omega. So omega of x, and uh, we're typically going to consider the di divergence as a function of the first argument given the second argument. So think of the second argument as the point that is already given to me, and x is the point that I'm trying to find. And omega is a, is a convex function. So it's a convex function uh, at x and the difference of the first order Taylor approximation at y. So what's the va difference between the value of the convex function at x minus the first order Taylor approximation? That's the value of d of uh, d omega of xy, so the divergence of x from with respect to y, it's not symmetric, but it is convex because the first argument is convex and the last argument is a linear function in that. And selecting different convex functions gives us divergences that we've already seen, I hope, in, in the past. So for instance, if I have just the squared Euclidean norm, then I get the squared Euclidean distance. If I consider omega x to be x log x minus xe, I get KL divergence. Uh, and if I have minus log xe, then I get what is known as the itakura saito divergence, which is being used in processing uh, speech signals. So various, many divergences, uh, they have very nice properties. And uh, plugging in different divergences gives us uh, different uh, convergence and regret bounds in these overarching algorithms, like online mirror descent. So uh, a common feature in all of these is that these are separable. And uh, all of the divergences that we were interested in, they're separable over the ground set. So in general, we consider minimizing separable, strictly convex functions over the submodular polytopes. 
So that's the setting that we are going to be considering. Right? So what are the decision sets? There's some modular base polytope, so think about the convex hull of permutations. What are the distances or the, or the convex functions? They are, they are from, uh, they're coming from minimizing Bregman divergences. And just for the purposes of this talk, you can think about the Euclidean distance. But the results apply to uh, more general convex functions. All right, so now let me explain the algorithm to you that we came up with. And uh, I, I really like this algorithm because it's super simple to state and it's quite easy to prove as well. I'm going to show it to you by picture. So here I'm projecting this point Y, which is 1.441, which is this red point here, right? And I'm projecting it to that shaded face, which is the base polytope that I showed you earlier, the convex hull of permutations. Um, okay, and I'm projecting this under the Euclidean norm, so which is the, the function written on, at the top. And the way the algorithm works is that it's a greedy increase in the gradient space. So what does that mean? It means that I'm going to look at the, all the elements. So I'm going to look at positions 1, 2, and 3. I'm calling them E1, E2, and E3. So those are the elements of my ground set. I'm going to order them in the gradient space greedily. What's the gradient at the second position? It is 0 minus 4, right? What's the gradient of the Euclidean norm? It's x minus y. And so that's the lowest element. E2 is at minus 4, then E1 is at minus 1.4, and E3 is at uh, minus 1. And now I'm going to increase E2 such that while maintaining that greedy ordering. So I'm going to increase E2, and this is going to correspond to a movement in, in the base in the polytope. So I'm going to do the increases in the gradient space. Those are going to correspond to movements in the polytope. I'm given an evaluation oracle to the uh, convex function. Yes, and I'm given the gradient oracle to the convex function. Yes, yes. Some modular function, I'm just given the evaluation oracle. Yeah. Um, right, so there, there, are, there, there are a lot of steps, but let me first tell you what the algorithm is. There are a lot of steps about how to do it exactly. Oh, yes, yes. So the input, I just have the uh, evaluation oracle to the sum order function. I don't know any, uh, so all of the results will apply to without knowing specific structure of the sum order function. All right, so the algorithm is that I'm going to increase elements while maintaining feasibility and the order of the elements in the gradient space. So first I increased E2, that resulted in this movement, but now E2 and E1 are, this, are at the same gradient. So I'm going to increase E1 and E2 together while respecting all the constraints of the polytope. At this point, I realize that actually E2 is tight. If I move any further in that second coordinate, that I'm going to violate the constraints of the polytope. So I freeze E2. I don't, I fix it. I don't move it anymore. And then I continue my gradient increase on E1 and E3. So that's the algorithm. Uh, this gives me the exact minimizer of my convex function. If it's a nice convex function like the Euclidean norm, I get, I can compute it exactly. If it's a, a more complex convex function, then up to accuracy that I can obtain. So any questions about what the algorithm is? It's a greedy increase in the gradient space. I start with a point which has some nice properties. In this case, I can start with zero. I start increasing, I order the, all the coordinates according to the gradient values at the starting point. Then I start increasing the gradients. That correspondingly increases the values in the original space inside the polytope. And after doing at most uh, the size of the ground set, so at most n increase such increases, I land up in the base polytope with exact minimizers. How did I get the 0 0.3? Ah, so that I had to compute. So at some point, I start increasing E1 and E3. At some point, I had hit a tight constraint. And the constraints of the submodular polytope said that uh, x, the value on any subset, has to be bounded by the submodular function value. In this case, at, at that, uh, at 0 0.3, uh, I hit the constraint that the value of all the elements sums up to six, which is uh, the tight constraint in this case. It can be two n, yeah. 
because you might either uh, make some gradients equal or you might fix some elements. So it's two n steps. Yes, so that's coming up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, selfish, uh, a shameless advertisement here. I'm going to talk more about this algorithm and give a proof of it at IASC on 8th at 4 p.m. in case you're interested on this. Uh, okay, so there, there are many, uh, many details that I've brushed under the rug. The, um, in, in the Euclidean case or KL divergence, the movement is along straight lines. But in general, when we are minimizing separable convex functions, the movement can be along a piecewise smooth curve. So it may not be as nice. And there are a lot of details on how to do this movement efficiently. And uh, a, quick, a quick answer to that is by, we can do the, these movements by doing line searches. So that's the second fundamental question I'm going to come to about how do you do line searches. So let me just write that here. And uh, so that's the part B of the talk. And you require to solve some nonlinear equations in a single variable. These nonlinear equations look like the gradient at some elements which is equal, the inverse of that gradient has to equal the submodular function value on a particular set. That's the form of these nonlinear equations. And after doing some more work, we can show that this algorithm can be implemented in n submodular function minimizations. So note that for these base polytopes, to even check feasibility in a point in the base polytope, you need to do one submodular function minimization. The constraints of these polytopes were uh, looked something like x of uh, e summed over e in a subset has to be at most f of s. There are exponentially many of these constraints. And uh, in order to find if a particular x is feasible in my polytope, I need to do a submodular function minimization. So what this is saying is that you can actually minimize convex functions by doing only a linear number of submodular function minimizations. And to be precise, it's around twice. So the factor is very low. And uh, sorry, capital M here. So this was just uh, uh, on, on the side. So I need to compute the exact minimizers in this algorithm. I cannot compute approximate minimizers. So some of the results with approximate some order function minimization where the M shows up, they have to be catered to give me exact maximal minimizers. M is the, the scale of the sum order function. So let's say your sum order function is not integral, then you make it integral, so you uh, scale it up from zero to capital M, that's like the scale. In the permutation case, actually, it's, it, uh, the algorithm becomes much simpler because you know the exact structure. Yeah. So, I, I would, so this results holds when you have no structure information about the sum order function. When you just have an evaluation oracle, this is what the result says. But in the case of, uh, so there are certain sum order functions which are cardinality based. So they have the form that f of s is equal to g of the cardinality of s, where g is a concave function, and permutations uh, are of that form. So if you recall, I had something like n minus, uh, n plus one minus s, for s equal to one to the cardinality. It's what gives you the permittahedron. And this is a concave function that only depends on the cardinality of that set and not the exact positions that you've selected. In, in this case, this algorithm can be implemented much faster because you can move along the lines and you can test for the next type constraint much faster. Gamma is evaluation oracle time. Okay, so, um, so for these cardinality-based functions, actually we can show that Ink fix takes order n square time, and sometimes even faster. So if your function values are uh, very few in number, if the uh, sum order function takes very few values, then it's even n log n plus k, where k is the number of function values. And what I'm going to show you is a simulation of, uh, so I'm going to compare ink fix to the Frank-Wolf algorithm. Frank-Wolf algorithm works by finding, starting with a point, and uh, finally computing the gradient of the convex function at that point, then it moves towards the vertex that minimizes that gradient. 
as a, as a linear function. And it only requires to compute the linear optimization in each iteration. So it's much less expensive than computing some model of function minimizations. And it computes approximate solutions. So it's not an exact algorithm. So I'm going to compare Frank Wolf to Inkfix. And what you see on the left side is how Frank Wolf iterates are converging to uh, the minimum norm point. And on, in the center, you see the gradient view. So you see that Inkfix is increasing gradients greedily. And at the, on, the, on the right side, you see Frank Wolf uh, slowly converging to the optimal gradients. So in some, the results are not always this great, but you can get such nice results in some cases, in some distributions of points and computing those projections. Uh, so here, I, I took a cardinality-based function with 100 elements, and I computed different distributions of points, and I started projecting them onto that the base polytope of that cardinality-based function. And what I'm showing you here is how Frank Wolf computed iterates, so that's the black line that's converging to optimality. That's the value. That's the, uh, the gap from optimality. And that should go to zero. And this is how uh, Inkfix computed that very fast. It's running time. Yeah. This is the running time. And these curves are the gradient views. So here I'm looking at the gradient. The red line is the gradient of the original point that I wanted to project. And the blue line is the gradient of the point that I've constructed in iteration, at each iteration. And Frank Wolf is converging. So Inkfix computes exact. They should, all go to zero, right? they should go to some value of the optimal point. Those are, that's just the gradient view. Because I explained Inkfix in the gradient space. So I plotted the gradients to show you a gradient increase. Oh, maybe I can. So this is the performance. The first plot is performance. The second, third plots, they should converge to the same value, right? Because they're both computing the optimal point. And the blue parts in the second plot are showing you how the gradients are increasing. So that shows you the greedy increase in the gradient space. And Frank Wolf is just like ad hoc uh, movements to the gra optimal gradients. It is moving. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it is moving. Yes. Frank Wolf is actually great for minimizing convex optimization yeah. over, yeah. yes. Wolf has, yes. So the Fujishika Wolf problem that only operates for minimum norm point. It's, it does not. Uh, that is only for minimum norm point, not for general. Yes. So the Wolf algorithm is for the minimum norm point. It's not for general convex minimization. It works for general if you take the dual of uh, your convex function. Is, is, is that what you're referring to? The, the, okay. Yeah, the, uh, the Frank Wolf variant for Fujishige, uh, the, the, uh, uh, if, you, if you try to do Wolf algorithm for general convex functions, you need to solve some problems that require uh, general convex minimization over the fine hull of the active set of points that you have. And that becomes an expensive set. So I agree, for minimum norm point, the Wolf algorithm does, that is used in practice. It, it is used to recover some model of function minimization, minimizers also. But uh, for general convex functions, that is not. Uh, yes, and, and, and that becomes like a much harder problem to solve. So, um, so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about ongoing work in, in this uh, direction. And here, I'm going to plot, I'm going to trace a frame in space and plot those projections onto the base polytope. So those are just the, the flat face on which the projections are happening. And as you can see, the projections have a lot of structure. They're, they're different under different uh, distances, under different divergences, but they have a lot of structure. And uh, when you see this structure, actually, there is a lot of uh, uh, 
it, it raises a lot of interesting questions, like learning from past projections. Suppose I were computing these projections inside online mirror descent or some first order method that was doing learning or machine learning or whatever, and uh, I already knew the projections of some points which were closer to my points. Could I reuse that computation without actually going through the combinatorial algorithm or the convex optimization algorithm and tell you what an approximate projection from the new point could be? So that's something we are working on, trying to find nice general convex minimization for structured objects. Uh, for, for some other uh, objects, and building an open source library to make all of these accessible to practitioners. And uh, a broader direction is really going across convex and combinatorial and seeing what can be better using techniques from the other uh, stack of optimization. So uh, with this, let me talk to you about the, the step that I brushed under the rug, which is feasibility along a line. So if I have a point in my uh, some other polytope, so this is my submodular polytope, and in this example, I'm going to take the extended submodular polytope, which does not have uh, non-negativity constraints. So it, it is uh, all, of, all of the shaded space. And I have that point, and I want to move along a line. How far can I move along a line while staying feasible? So it's a fundamental question that arises in many algorithms, again, uh, in Ingfix, of course, in Frank Wolf, in Carrot Theory's theorem, in implementing finding the, uh, the convex hull of points, and in some other uh, uh, interesting applications like finding denser subgraphs uh, in, in uh, so I, I was talking to Visa Research and they try to look at the fraud uh, credit transactions uh, data and try to figure out whether they can find the denser subgraph of those fraud credit transactions and block a card uh, so that it does not have any more fraudulent transactions. And that, uh, that can be done by solving these line search problems. Uh, minimum ratio problems study the strength of the networks and so on. So uh, to cut the story short, this has many applications. And um, Inkfix, as we saw, uh, we were only increasing the gradients in Inkfix. So Inkfix only resulted in positive directions. And this was a case that was well understood. But Inkfix got us to this problem that, you know, what happens when my directions were uh, not always positive and there were general directions? In that case, uh, the best known algorithm was Megiddo's parametric search that maintains a parameter lambda and tries to figure out at what point do I get out of the submodular polytope. And that he had really used n to the eight submodular function minimizations, which was very expensive. So we thought about this problem in, uh, from scratch and thought of, uh, okay, you know, these were the constraints of my submodular polytope. And I just want to find lambda, I want to maximize lambda such that lambda d is in the submodular polytope. So without loss of generality, I can search from zero instead of search from an arbitrary point. And rewriting this expression, I get the maximization of lambda such that the min of fs minus lambda ds, which is just the feasibility, that has to be greater than zero. So a little uh, notation here, the, I'm denoting this sum as x of s. So I'm just, that's a shorthand for the sum. And uh, so that's, I, I want to satisfy all the constraints and I want to see how far can I move lambda while satisfying constraints. So one, uh, one way one could think about this problem is for each subset, plot fs minus lambda ds. So ds is, d is the direction I want to move in and ds is the sum of the components of that direction over the set s. So I just plot fs minus lambda ds over as lambda increases. So it's a function of lambda, and I will have an exponential number of lines like that, right? So the goal is to look at the, 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 uh, the minimum envelope, the lower envelope of these, all of these exponentially many lines, and find out lambda such that the minimum is still, the lower envelope is still above zero. Does that make sense? So I plotted each of my constraints, I asked, you know, how far can I increase lambda such that each of those constraints remains feasible? I want to find lambda such that the lower envelope still stays at zero or above zero, which tells me that it's feasible, the point is feasible, and I want to find that lambda. Binary search would work. I could uh, shoot out and I could say, okay, if it's feasible or not, and I could half and I could do that, but that gives me something which is not strongly polynomial in time. Um, that that would work. 
that would, uh, I mean, there would be an epsilon up because the sum of function values can be really small. And if you want something that's independent of the value of the sum of function, then uh, binary search would not work. Because, um, um, let's say at least for infix, we would need a strongly polynomial time algorithm if it was just positive direction. The infix, infix running time is strongly polynomial, for instance. L come, M comes into the log, yeah. All right, so can anybody suggest an algorithm to find this lambda? Hint, it was an Anand's talk. So we use the discrete Newton method. And um, what we can do is we can shoot out. So we can shoot out such that we, are, we know that we are infeasible. So just select any constraint and violate that. So you know you're outside the polytope. So you're definitely in, in this uh, negative part here. And at that point, you do a sum model of function minimization, trace the curve back, and continue discrete Newton's iterations to find that lambda star. But the open question here was that we do not have any bound for the number of iterations for discrete Newton method. And in this work, we showed that actually you can bound the number of iterations by a quadratic, and uh, that resulted in an n to the six improvement in the strongly polynomial running time. So how much time do I have? Six minutes. Okay. Let me... Uh, through the intuition of the proof, or okay, let's go through it quickly. So the the main idea behind the proof of like one of the crucial ideas behind the proof of this uh, of proving the number of iterations of the discrete Newton method was showing that how many how many sets can I have that grow uh, geometrically in the function value while still having a submodel of function. So how many? So if I have a sequence of sets s1 to sq and the value of each subsequent set increases by a factor of four, and I know this function is some modeler, then how long can the sequence be? And what happens is that uh, because of some modularity, which has some nice properties of uh, uh, bounding the value of the intersection of the union of sets, we can show that any subsequent set in that subsequence cannot rise from the ring family of sets which I've seen earlier. But if I want to construct a sequence of ring families where a new set is added in each, uh, at each point, then that length can only be quadratic. And this is the exact quadratic that you see in the, uh, in the bound for the Newton's iterations. The open, a very nice open question here is we still have no idea about the number of breakpoints in the lower envelope. We know that the lower envelope has at least linear breakpoints. There are examples for that. But uh, this is showing only that the discrete Newton method will take quadratic iterations. It does not say anything about the number of breakpoints. Breakpoint was in, in the lower envelope when you had those lines. It's a piecewise linear curve with some breakpoints. Then how many breakpoints can that have? Yes, if the number of breakpoints are lower, then you can improve. But at this point, we don't even know if it's even quadratic. All right, so with this, let me uh, come to the third part, which I'm just going to give uh, a, a, just uh, a, an example to motivate it, but not go into the details. So this is about counting. And the example here is a ranking duel. So Bing had this uh, uh, organized this competition, where they asked users to search for their, uh, some phrase and they showed two sets of search results. So here I searched for famous artists, and the two set of search results, uh, they were shown one from Bing, one from Google, with all the branding removed. So as a user, I did not know which of them came from Bing or Google. 
and I was supposed to select which of the search results I liked better. So under the premise that users will like search results that rank the pages they are looking for higher, we can say that suppose the first engine showed Picasso, Van Gogh, Dali, Monet, then all of the users that were looking for those artists would be happier with the first set of results. And in the second set of results, uh, Da Vinci and Michelangelo users would be happier. Now, what could a search engine in, in this setup where they're trying to gain most of the users do so that so as to game the system, so as to get as many users from the other search engine? What could be a potential uh, um, opposing strategy here for any search, either search engine? Search queries higher, but I could just look at the other search engine's queries and copy all of them, remove the topmost one, and every user who was not looking for the topmost entry would now migrate to my search engine. Even though the search results were completely bizarre, all I needed to do was better the search engines of my competitor. Right? So I could just remove the topmost entry and move everything up by one, and now all of the users would go under that. And such interactions can be modeled. Uh, so the question is, what is the best decision, decision given the competition for either search engine? And this becomes a very nice uh, saddle point problem where you want to minimize uh, the max uh, loss for the other search engine by computing uh, bipartite matchings where go from pages to the rankings that you're showing them. And uh, this loss incidentally cannot be modeled using the permutations uh, representation. So you actually have to model that using bipartite matchings. And um, title point problems can also be solved in the online learning setup. So one could use online mirror descent, as we discussed so far, and compute projections onto the base polytope and compute uh, the solutions to these uh, problems, the Nash equilibrium for this. Or one could also use something known as the multiplicative weights update algorithm or the optimistic mirror descent, uh, also optimistic mirror descent to find uh, to sort of to learn over and, and find solutions, uh, the Nash equilibrium to these games. And these, now in this case, this would require counting over the vertices of the polytope. So you need to be able to compute approximately partition functions uh, uh, in polynomial time. And what we are working on is, is showing that efficient counting would actually imply efficient convex optimization in, in general. You may not even have separable uh, functions, but uh, you can do efficient convex optimization by going into like a bloated space and counting over the vertices of that combinatorial polytope. I'm sorry. Uh, you'll have to remind me about the result because what you showed, I think, was that if you have a point in the interior of the polytope, you can represent that as a convex combination. And you can, you can actually use multiplicative weights to minimize convex functions over the marginals of the original polytope. Okay. I, I, I know I checked this, like, uh, there, there's some, some differences in, in the technique and all. Okay. Uh, so this was a summary, and uh, I'm out of time, so let me not go over future research directions, but just encourage you to apply to uh, the Georgia Tech ISY PhD program. And yeah, thanks for your attention, and I can take any questions now. There are some non-separable functions that they would extend to, but uh, they're very specific and catered. So I, I, I did think about that. I'm not sure exactly how to extend. It will require more work. But the, the proof of the separable one is uh, it, it comes really from first order optimality conditions. So maybe from there you can uh, deduce something about non-separable also. Like the algorithm seems to be using quite 
uh, nicely the non separability like you increase each coordinate independently yes. and so i was wondering if you have thought about extending the algorithm itself uh, to non separable what happens is that you could do the greedy increase you could look at the gradients and the partial derivatives and you could do that greedy increase but what you want is really that if i increase the element the value of some other element later on it does not damage the the partial derivatives that i have already fixed so th so then it that works for some functions it does not work for some other functions so that's where the yeah okay we can take it offline